So we're here with uh, famed MAGA communist JJ McCullough. JJ, what does MAGA communism mean to you? It's not a thing, for starters. Well, why do you identify as one? I don't identify as one. I don't identify as either MAGA or communist, <laughs> let alone MAGA communist. So make America great communism? Yeah. It's not a thing. This is one of Greg's many, like, internet freakazoid <laughs> Okay, well, well, JJ, if you're not a MAGA communist, what are you? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a moderate dispositional conservative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... On the Horseshoe Theory Pod, you're in the perfect position between far leftist me, mega communist Greg, and yes. and narco capitalist Brogan. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I guess you're like authoritarian, right? No, no. We have to get the libertarian spectrum in there. That's okay, fine. that's fine. I accept it. I accept it. It's because I'm I'm older than both of you, uh -huh. so I'm 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 more I'm more mature. So I have a more mature political philosophy. Yeah, JJ, you've been you've been on that cope for years. <laughs> Years at this point, JJ has one of these copes where he thinks that the, the kids, the youth who grew up on the internet, yeah. are going to somehow like eventually just grow older and become conservative. And they don't, he doesn't realize that growing older and becoming conservative means that they become MAGA communists instead of anarcho communists. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case. And that's the case. That's why there's so many MAGA communists. There aren't that many MAGA communists. There aren't any MAGA communists. There's dozens of us. No. <laughs> Does moderate not. conservatism exist on the internet? Moderate conservatism? Yeah, it does. Like one of my favorite uh, websites and podcasts is The Bulwark. This is a sort of, uh, it's a. Who watches The Bulwark? Lots of people do. 50 year olds. I've, I've seen The Bulwark meetings and it's all like boomers. It's all like 60, 70 year old women. It's still on the internet. It's so nice that he's saying those bad things about Trump. So, like, The Bulwark is like sort of moderate conservatives, people that were Republicans but left the Republican Party over Trump, over Trump's ascendancy. Okay. And so now it's one of my favorite places to go because. You know, they're critical of Trump and the modern Republican Party. They're, they vote Democrat, so they support the Democratic Party. But, you know, they're getting there from a kind of unleft perspective. And that's actually kind of like the philosophy that I try to associate my own channel this is with. A, this is a terrible term that JJ's trying to popularize. Yeah. The word unleft, even though it doesn't make any sense. It does make sense because More it's like, like... a left. No, it's, it's sort of like... Non-left. You can be... You can be... You can be against sort of some aspects of the left without defining your politics in fundamental opposition to the left, right? Because that's what so many right-wing spaces are all about, primarily. They're not about a, putting forward a positive vision of any sort of conservative agenda. It's just about sort of dunking on left-wingers all of the time. Whereas, and then, of course, they won't be skeptical of the, of the right because, you know, in the war against the left-wingers, against the woke, all the rest of that, no enemies to the right. And then the bulwark people, and I think the sort of people that I care about or the sort of people that I identify with are people that are fighting for some degree of sort of consistent conservative principles and coming at politics from a sort of conservative disposition, which is different than necessarily a conservative ideology, and being able to point out the flaws of both the, the left and the right. Greg is enjoying licking his little nicotine lozenge. Mm. <laughs> Doing a nick lick. Yeah, Brogan, Brogan's mad about all this chewing that was going on in the podcast. Yeah, it was uh, pretty annoying. I, I've, I've, I've decided, I've decided to just lick this nicotine lozenge instead. Um, non left. Yeah, the woke shit broke the right wing. They ruined them. I was just like anybody I talk to is right wing. It's just anti left. It's super yeah. weird. Yeah, it's really straight. It's it's, it's frustrating. Like because no one has like opinions on anything. Even like Polyev goes too far into the anti woke stuff. He released like an email blast about like the WEF, and I'm like, I don't give up. Like, don't talk about this left or right. Like NDP, like, anybody. Don't fucking bring this up. I'm so sick of hearing about these issues because they're not issues. I can't afford a fucking house. And you're talking about like gender diversity for fucking university students. I, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, but most people do. Like this is what gets the clicks. This is what gets the fundraising dollars. There, it's not clear if it wins elections. And that's a significant point, right? So the Republicans have been running really hard on the anti-woke stuff. You know, they've been running really hard on social issues in particular, yeah. it's particularly very hard against transgender stuff. And it has, you know, built a lot of media empires. It's made a lot of people very popular on sort of the talking head uh, circuit. Yeah. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that this works in terms of mobilizing kind of moderate middle class people to the polls. And in America, just as it is in this country, right, like the ideal... <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> you guys are all... Greg is Greg is really is enslaved to his uh, to his to his drugs, mm. his sensual, his making out with his uh, nicotine lozenge. So it's uh, does so it's not mobile. Like it's not gonna. It, it doesn't seem like there's a lot polls. of evidence that it, it moves people to the polls. Like it, it, there's evidence that 
again, like it, it rallies the base, but what, and this is actually one of the sort of the phenomenons of sort of a polarized political climate is that you have messages that resonate very strongly with your people, but ultimately elections are won not by the extreme left and not by the extreme right. And both people Except on the extreme- in Argentina, just yesterday, anarcho-capitalist Javier Millier won, and he was on the extreme right, capitalism, so. Well, we don't know exactly- uh, how Argentine politics Ah, uh, all of a sudden the goalposts have shifted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's... The, the thing is, like, a lot of extremists in, in politics, both on the far left and the far right, have this theory that more people are extremists than they even know, and that if we just shift the Overton window enough, if we just make sort of more extremist rhetoric more mainstream, then that is going to kind of, like, activate some sort of critical mass of the electorate, right? Like, this was a big part of sort of the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? It's that, like, a lot more people are, are hungering for a far-left agenda, and if we just put a far-left agenda on the table, you know, then this is going to activate lots of voters who have been previously sort of disillusioned with the, you know, the political options that have been presented to them previously. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that suggests that that works. And there doesn't also seem to be a lot of evidence that suggests that that works on the right wing either. Yeah. Like if you put forward this extreme like MAGA agenda, you know, the Republicans have been facing loss after loss. It's really only Trump himself who seems to be able to make it work. And that might be because Trump is a very idiosyncratic figure who people perceive differently. Yeah. Well, what, what, what happens when they ban conversion therapy for 16 year olds yeah like what's next yeah right like what's the agenda besides just like getting rid of critical race theory in public school yeah and then what i don't yeah. that's that's where i'm like that's where it really drives me nuts is it's like it's like it's like a pretend agenda it's like a fake agenda yeah and then the question as well is like how do we know if this is quote-unquote working right yeah like what are the outcomes like what is the outcome based assessment that we use to determine that you know the good of banning critical race theory or you know gender transitioning in minors or whatever like how do we know that we've succeeded that society is better off because of doing that if, if there's no obvious metric if it's just you know i don't like this and therefore i want to ban it then that's just a purely reactionary impulse well critical race theory isn't even a thing right like it's there's no there's nothing there's no agenda there's no doctrine there's no list of like subjects <laughs> called critical race it doesn't exist which it's, is like, it's like woke, right? Like these are just sort of terms that are used to describe a so, kind of vibe of a certain agenda. That yeah, you like. talking about racism in schools. I, I don't know. It's so weird. If it's like, if, if a white dude talks about the history of racism to a group of grade 10s, it's like um, African-American history class. If a non-binary person with blue hair does it, it becomes critical race theory. Yeah. Right? It's, just, it's really strange. There's literally nothing defines critical race theory. It just makes people uncomfortable and people have an instinct to, I think, uh, go after stuff that makes them uncomfortable. I mean, obviously, there are extreme sort of manifestations of this that 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 I think people are right to be kind of repulsed by, you know, when people are renaming schools, uh, uh, you know, after very innocuous sort of political figures or historical figures and all that. Sorry. JJ's on his black pill arc recently. He's getting black pilled on the youth because he's had this cope for many years that the, the youth would eventually come see reason. But now they're all reading Osama bin Laden. What do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I made a uh, I made a video about that recently because I don't know if you guys, well, you clearly did, were aware of that, that there was this through sort you. of, yeah, through me. Through you being triggered about it. Through me being triggered about it. Yeah, there was apparently this kind of like viral TikTok trend about sort of the young people being uh, uh, sort of seduced by Osama bin Laden's manifesto. And they were like looking at it and being like, oh my God, what have they been keeping from us? Oh, Osama bin Laden, he's so insightful and wise and he makes so many good points and I can't believe they were they were telling us to hate him and blah, 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 blah. We you never know, heard his side of the story. Uh, we have heard his side of the story. I mean, it's just that, I guess, I mean, I don't know what to make of it. There's like lots of different ways to kind of get at this. You know, some people... Uh, sort of said that this was just kind of like my set, the kind of cranky older person set who was just hungering for reasons to be outraged at the young and that you sort of take these very isolated data points and then sort of extrapolate them into a larger trend that might not actually exist. So like some people have been like, well, it was just like a handful of videos and it wasn't that big of a deal. And you think of how many videos are put out mm, on That's TikTok. COPE too. But, you know, I processed it in the context of, like, knowing through you that, you know, there are young people that fetishize, you know, the Unabomber. And, you know, obviously there's been a lot of young people fetishizing Hamas since the, the recent war. Not a small number of them either. It's, but it's hard. Like, it's, it's, it's hard to know how seriously to take a lot of this stuff, right? There are internet subcultures that exist and are extreme. They engage in a type of politics that is very shrill and performative. 
but we don't really know if this is reflective of broader trends within within the actual electorate. The average boomer millennial has no idea what's going to hit them. They have no idea what's coming. But like, what is like, what is the manifestation of this in the real world? Uh, everyone's going to be based. No, no, no. But I'm saying like, even if we look at like the way politics is evolving in the present day, beyond the fact that there's a lot of weirdos online, like, do you see any evidence that this is permeating the real world? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Online politics manifests in real politics more and more. Such as? Memes. Memes and presidential campaigns. Uh-huh. Yeah. But like, and then like, but how does it actually? Imagine work? imagine the average person just has an extremist perspective. What do you think comes of that? I, I think like the, like the Oklahoma City bombing was a result of that. And nothing like that has happened since. What do you mean? Like the, the Oklahoma City bombing was a direct, like he got radicalized. Through like radical politics, through uh, the Turner Diaries, yeah, like really far right, yeah, racist, yeah, like that keeps happening, and it looks like that keeps happening. If you, if you want to take like people getting radicalized to like uh, on the right, yeah, or young people getting radi- radicalized to being alt right, but yeah. it never has there been like a mass casualty incident since. Like I wouldn't count Virginia, like the um, Unite the Right rally, because it just like that seemed like not a terrorist attack, but something like as as. Big as the Oklahoma City bombing hasn't happened since. No, not a massive terrorist attack, but I think that, and I think you're you're raising an important uh, sort of data point, is that there have been a number of like massacres that have been inspired by sort of racist or anti-Semitic kind of you know agendas, and when you look at the manifestos of those people, it does seem like that they, or you look at just the background of where they were hanging out and all the rest of that, that does seem like it was it was in some ways a product of an internet-based radicalization cycle. And it's only going to get more popular as time goes on. Well, I mean, but this is but this is the thing. It's like, I don't know, like, does terrorism... I guess terrorism counts as politics, you know? Massacres count as politics. I was maybe sort of thinking in a more sort of innocuous way, like, is there evidence that this is affecting the democratic process? Like, is there evidence that sort of the results of elections are in any... or that politicians are in any way sort of sensitive to... No, you're already seeing on the right with the Republican Party. But that's hard to sort of say because it's like... To what degree was the Republican Party's sort of id always in a kind of more extreme right direction? And, you know, like, to what degree was it Donald Trump himself responsible for just sort of breaking these taboos? And then some of the Internet freaks on the far right sort of saw Trump as as one of their own. Well, well, what do do you think? These trends, if they continue, what, what do you think is the result of it? I don't know, because, like, again, like, it's just not obvious to me the way that these online trends, like the growth of extremism online is manifesting in real world. Your instinct politics. is that nothing ever changes. So this will just change nothing. Well. So there's no point in getting mad about the Osama kids. Maybe, maybe, maybe people like me are just, and I think that that's a critique that I was kind of a little bit sensitive to, the idea that, like, you know, you're just getting hysterical about nothing. But it's, but who's making that critique? It's other millennial boomers. Yeah, pretty trans, much. Trans boomer millennials. Yeah. And they have no idea what's coming. <laughs> they have no idea what's going to hit what's, them like what, a train. What's coming? What's coming? Only, only you have a, va- a faint idea of what's going to hit you but like you, a train. You tell me, you tell me what's Relationship with me. You tell me what's coming then, Greg. Uh, Wee! That's the sound of a train running everybody over. Yeah, yeah. Just I don't climate know. change is making things worse all across the globe. Immigration crisis, economic collapse, yeah. cultural collapse. Everyone gets extreme. Everyone gets radicalized on the internet, but at the same time, nothing actually happens because we're all alone in our cubes. That's roughly what's going to happen. Yeah. I think uh, you know things get radical, and then people see the trend, and they and they yell against it, and then nothing happens. Nothing happens. Okay, so you're on the side of nothing happening. I'm on the side of, like... Well, that's a relief. (laughs) I'm on the side side of nothing happening. I think there's going to be, like, a... I think the crazy thing's going to happen in the next 20 years. It's going to be, like, a militia. It's going to be, like, a breakaway militia in, like, Houston or something. Some are weird. Like, Phoenix, Arizona. Like, half the city is going to fall to, like, a militia instead of the police force, and, like, no one's going to die, and nothing bad's going to happen about it. Yeah. There's going to be some weird thing like that. Yeah. Of, like, some right-wing militia taking, like, a town. Mm. Mm. That's it. It's yeah, we seem to forget that every two weeks some crazy shit happens in the news, and we just forget about it. Well, but, yeah, uh, that, that's not going to happen. That's not going to slow down. Every two weeks there's going to be some more crazy shit that happens, and then you'll just compartmentalize, compartmentalize, compartmentalize every 30 seconds. I mean, the the argument that I'm sort of sensitive to is that, and this is sort of something... World's like, ending. <laughs> sort of like conservatives don't like to concede this point, but I do think that like in a middle-class society, you have more reason to sort of fear right-wing extremism than left-wing extremism. Get rid of that. Throw it away. Crunch it, please. I can't take that anymore. Yes, there you go. 
No, like in in a middle class society, like the the bigger sort of political threat tends to come from the far right than from the far left. You know, a society like because the far left ultimately mobilizes the poor, I think, when it manifests, and we just don't have enough poor people to make a sort of broad based far left. Certainly, like a broad based like. How many Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck, JJ? That's not poverty. How many? Like ca- how many Canadians? Class, Answer the question. How many? Being, being a what percentage? Class, Forty. Being a middle class person. How many are in debt? It, that's not the same. Like, it's not the same as like you know a guy in Peru who is rallying people that literally have nothing and scavenging. Yeah, it's for true. Garbage. This is this is one of your more, more lucid points, actually, considering yeah. that you're on the right, that you recognize the far right, because most people on the right think that the far left is a bigger threat. Yes, because they because they're just they have less in common with the far left. Yes, and it's like, what does the far left promise? You know, the far left promises a radical restructuring of society in order to redistribute wealth, right? But in a middle class society, most people are doing reasonably well financially. Like most people, are, at the very least, have lives of relative relative comfort and stability. And so they do not, most middle class people do not have an interest in destabilizing that system. Most, uh, most middle class people, however, do have an interest in fighting back against those who are perceived as going to destabilize that system, which is the far left, right? So if the far left becomes perceived as a big enough threat, if the far left is perceived, you know, uh, be endangering the economy, be in, 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 you know, endangering, you know, the, the sort of the lifestyle that middle class people have become accustomed to, then there becomes support for more extreme sort of reactionary politics. This is all a bunch of copy words. You don't know what's you know what's coming. Political analysts have no idea what's going on. You only can look in the past and be like, well, this happened in the past, so it'll probably continue in the future. Everything's different now. Trends are completely different. The psychological landscape is entirely different. You don't know what's coming. It's a train, though. Would you rather get a train run on your society uh-huh. <laughs> or two of your teeth pulled out? No. <laughs> What does is, what is, this even mean? Like, you know, JJ, would you rather get a train run on your man? On my man? Yeah, on your man. On my man? Like my person? JJ's a homosexual. You're dating a guy. Oh. Would you rather get a, a train run on him or one of your teeth pulled out? I mean, one of my teeth pulled out? Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like the only person who's answered the train. Yeah, why would you answer the train? I value my teeth more than any broad of them dating, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this could change. This could change, but... You know, this is the first, this is the hard launch of the, of the podcast. <laughs> I think I want to take like a, just a minute. Right, yeah. We, we, this is like the 10th episode. We've got, we've got 10 episodes under our belt. We've got JJ yeah. McCullough on the pod. Yeah. We've got high quality audio equipment. Yeah. We've, we've been keeping this podcast a secret. We've been keeping this a secret. YouTube channel. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't launched this officially until this episode. This is it. Yeah. There's now, there's a, there's a profile picture. There's community posts. Mm-hmm. This is it. I'm honored. I'm honored to be part of the uh, the breakthrough episode. We were waiting for you. We yeah, were, we, we were, were waiting for you. We were going to do it earlier, and I said, let's wait for JJ. We were waiting for J- my mega communist, JJ McCullough. The coming out episode. I'm excited this for is, it. This is the coming out episode. Yeah, the yeah. podcast now exists. We are finally, we, we're coming out. Okay, well, that's good. Well, I hope I, I hope I can hope I can live up to the reputation. JJ McCullough has encouraged me to come out. Why haven't you killed yourself yet? <laughs> <laughs> Why would I do that? I've been listening to Brogan's mugs. Yeah, Brogan's mugs. Where's your uh, my mugs in my, in my room? Hmm. Brogan's I'll take is uh, Brogan's take on uh, on suicide. I'm very partial to. I yeah, think, you know, restigmatize suicide. Restigmatizing stu- suicide. I think that's an interesting take. Every time I am, uh, every time I talk to, I sent a tweet about this recently. Like every time I talk to Americans, one thing that they always want to talk about is the the maid regime, the medically assisted dying regime mm-hmm. in Canada, and it it it's it has a real sort of hold on a lot of people's imaginations in the U S I think in this country too, although it's less debated in this country because we just debate much less in this country overall. But I think that some people are uncomfortable with the idea of suicide being a right suicide, being a human right, the way that basically our courts have ruled it is. And so I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of partial to this idea where you just kind of like, no, it's bad. Don't do it. You know? Yeah. In all circumstances. I don't know. Maid's a weird one. I always make myself. I never know what they're doing up there. Yeah. Um, maid is a weird one because if you're like 85 and terminally ill, it kind of like you have to define like what a life worth living is, right? Because if you if you're going to die from an illness and you're in extreme pain, I think you have the right to like go with dignity. Mm-hmm. But then there's the case of the woman who was applying to get a wheelchair ramp installed at her local legion she was an amputee from uh the afghan war yeah and in the process they offered her maid yeah she's like like missing a leg in a mm-hmm. wheelchair just wanted a wheelchair ramp to get into the legion to get three dollar pints of keith's 
and they offered her maid. They're like, oh, you should kill yourself. Yeah. Uh, this is also an option. If you can't get the wheelchair ramp, you could always kill yourself. Right, because you don't have the funding yeah. to give her wheelchair ramp for free. Which is, that's fucking absurd. It's like the whole thing is when you start bringing in the fact there's like a profit motive mm-hmm. to maid. What like, is, What is the profit motive? Someone makes money the more people do maid. Whether it's like the companies that produce the... um. The, uh, what, what, what do you call it? The euthanasia pills? Yeah, the euthanasia, the yeah, pills, the, or the, the injection. Yeah, or the, the company, like, the There's whole, a profit incentive for everything. There's a profit incentive. So it's like, it's not, I just think it's like too powerful to play with, you know? I just don't think it's like. You don't see like ads on the bus, like, die. No, because we, we, have, we have hospice. Like, if you're terminally ill, you basically like already get made. It just soft made where you go to a room and you're in a comfy bed and they give you opiates until you pass away. Mm. That's what hospice is. Yeah, but they don't actually make you pass away quicker. No, but you're, you're not in pain. You like you, you get blasted with dilaudid and just right. like live in the bliss in the last two weeks of your right. life until you die. That's what, you know, Jimmy Carter's wife just went through that. Yeah. The thing the thing that I'm always sort of confused by as a sort of like the moral dimension of this is just that, like, for example, like when my grandmother was dying, I remember this because my parents were away and I, I the doctor actually gave me the forms and like showed it to me because it was sort of like you can be kept at different levels of care. Right. right. And then there was like the the lowest one is like comfort care which is basically when they're not actively doing things to keep you alive. They're just keeping you comfortable, and then they're sort of just letting nature take its course. And in that way, that feels like a kind of consensual death. Yeah. Right? Like, you're making a decision. Like, the decision to withhold medical treatment from someone is basically confirming that, like, I'm okay with this person dying. And then, you know, the person that is in that position, you know, if they're not completely out of it, they're exercising their agency. They're saying, yeah, keep me at that level, right? And we've had that regime, Arun, forever. Do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate, you know, pulling the plug, all of these kind of cliches. So it's just like, if we've been cool with that, what makes... The suicide The suicide is, I guess, a little bit more explicit in the sense that it's more immediate. But, like, because, I mean, the Supreme Court of this country has ruled that basically if the Constitution's right to life means anything, it has to include the right to dictate the circumstances of how they phrased it as your passage into death. Like that's an inseparable part from the right to life. And I think that makes a kind of sense, but definitely once you acknowledge that that right exists, that constitutional legal right exists, it becomes very difficult to set parameters around things like MAID or things like you know, euthanasia. And that's actually been one of the problems with, with uh, you know, because the Trudeau government tried to pass a sort of restrictive regime around how and when you could use MAID, but then subsequent court rulings have sort of said, like, no, this is a right, and you cannot impose restrictions on this right any more than you can impose restrictions on other fundamental human rights. So, I don't know, it's just, it's a very... It's, it's, it's fascinating just because we are, I think, in real time witnessing the emergence of a new legal human right yeah of a sort that we haven't seen in a long time yeah i know it's it's like a moral it's like, it's i think it's too powerful yeah it's too powerful of an argument because it's too like you know where they where they have they extended it to mental health cases yet yeah yeah uh, like you can you can get made if you're depressed yeah yeah like that's uh, that that was legalized in march that's that, that's too far that's too much I of think. a but then, I mean, like, the thing is, though, that, like, this is one, and it's kind of like abortion in some ways, right? Like, it's, it's, it's an intimate, personal decision. And I think that at the end of the day, a lot of people are very uh, sensitive to that argument, right? Like, that it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of say that society as a whole, or certainly politicians, or you or me, or anybody, kind of has a right to sort of busybody someone else's personal decision. It is an anti-liberal case. Liberal, you know, you have your rights... One of the rights is rights over your own autonomy and your yeah. own body, and if you're not doing something that affects other people, yeah, 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 directly. And it's and it's and I mean, and but I guess that's kind of like what makes sort of like your effort to kind of like restigmatize suicide interesting because you kind of concede that it is fundamentally a sort of like illiberal argument, right? Like that there isn't really a fully rational legalistic case that you can make, but you can just kind of say, I think on a whole, society is not benefited this but that's that's a difficult argument to make politically and it would certainly not stand up in it has it has been a sin it has been a sin throughout time yeah. Yeah. and you know i've sent you some some factoids throughout uh, history where they would like if you killed yourself they drag your body through the streets you wouldn't get a proper burial the state would confiscate all of your money yeah back yeah. in the time of louis the 16th or whatever mm. same in, uh, in ancient greece 
Same kind of thing. What would they do in ancient Greece? I don't know the specifics, but it was it was like frowned upon. It was yeah. like seen as a. And Catholicism has suicide as a sin because you're responsible for your own body as a as a as a creature. Oh my fucking god! What is it? We'll discuss it later. Just close it. Yeah. <sighs> Um, the, the thing is, is that, you know, sometimes you reach the limits of, or sometimes liberalism and the logic of liberalism brings you to uncomfortable places. You know, the logic of a democratic sort of rights, individual rights-based society. And, you know, when you have a sort of robust, uh, court system that interprets the constitution in a very you know, generous way as, as far as individual rights go, as our constitution has been interpreted by our courts and the American constitution has as well. Like there becomes, there becomes limited sort of options on the table to push back against that sort of thing. And that's why I think that you find that some of these right wingers, like some of these so-called like national conservatives, the nat cons and stuff, they are increasingly just making arguments. That just like, I just don't care about liberalism. I just don't care about legalism. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. And I just want government to just kind of like impose you know, my vision of an arbitrary good or bad sort of standard of morality on the, you know, on the nation. And that kind of stuff troubles me a lot. Like, that seems bad. Like, that seems like a bad political philosophy to have because then you just inevitably go to the question of, like, well, who are you to decide? Right? Well, but, so they, but stigmatizing suicide is fundamentally one of those. I know, but that's what I'm saying, right? Like, it's, it's, it's interesting, and I feel like, like, my instincts are with Brogan on this, but I also acknowledge that it is fundamentally an arbitrary position. I mean, it's really, it's really a message for the people who watch you, who are young people, yeah. who have the rest of their lives ahead of them and have stupid brainwormy thoughts of, you know, I want to join the 27 club, which I do three months. <laughs> so, cause you know, so, yeah. So it's like it, it, some of these things work as, as cultural uh, agendas more than they work as political agendas. Yes. Yeah, it just, it's the same with made. It's just some things you can't, yeah, the end of rationality, you can't rationalize it, you can't really make it. Yeah, you, that, that's why That's why you don't really have to talk about it very much. Yeah. You just have to say you'll miss the big show. Yeah, you miss and the that's big it. show. That's it. A lot of arguments should begin and end with like just a pithy couple of sentences. I agree. Yeah. I agree 100%. Um... Oh, no, in ancient Greece, that's what I was trying to remember. In ancient Greece, suicide was a sin because you were seen as, like, your your purpose was to protect your land. So it was a crime against the state if you killed yourself because oh, yeah. you have to protect Athens. In, in Athens, you have to protect Athens. Yeah. That's mm. interesting. Which is great. I think that's a great reason to not kill yourself. That's a terrible reason not to kill yourself because I have to, like, I have to live longer to support whoever is oppressing me. Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind it of sucks. A fascistic logic. You yeah, know, no, it's, it's great. You exist to serve regime all you have to say you'll miss the big show suicide is cringe and everyone will agree to remember you poorly yeah that's it that's true yeah that's all you need like if you you said if one of your friends killed themselves you would respect them less you wouldn't view them fondly you would obviously be sad yeah for, for a time and you'd be kind to their family but you would remember them poorly and you would not take anything they said importantly you know they, they would have no impact on on the world really no positive impact with their death yeah yeah. Yeah. Healthy twenty something man. Yeah. Just be like, I'm gonna kill myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is why we're gonna do a show where we make fun of people who killed themselves. <laughs> a loser. <laughs> Mark Fisher, pussy. Oh man. We should do a video on that. We should, do, <laughs> we should do a collective video on like can you trust depressed people? Can you trust Mark Fisher? Mm -hmm. Like it, should capitalist realism just be like written off as like a depressed man's ramblings about like how he how he specifically felt about the world because he was depressed and like and doomerish about everything but isn't that kind of like a isn't that kind of like a stereotype of depressive people like that their depression manifests through like say their 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 professional life their, like, per, their personal philosophy yeah and and like their their social commentary like because i feel like that's not necessarily the case like i feel like there's been a lot of people that have been you know very successful and even you know promoted optimistic uh, ideas and things, but have been privately depressed. 
Like, I feel like that this could be something that the, uh, I don't know, the pro-depression lobby could find fault with, because it is a sort of, like, stigma that's based on a certain stereotype of what a depressive person is life, like. Right? Yeah. And I think that depression is often, like, a very sort of private problem that people struggle with, and people often do put on a brave face, and people do compartmentalize. So this idea of, like, depression is this, like, totalizing identity that inf affects everything you do. And then the, the inverse is true as well. Like, I think that there are a lot of people that, probably make very bleak art or very bleak social commentary that don't have a lot, you know, quote unquote, to complain about. Yeah. Like, I think that, I think actually that this manifests a lot in the form of political extremism. When you see political extremists on the right or the left who are bitching about how terrible everything is, how broken our society is, and, you know, blah, 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 and you ask them, well, how are you doing? And it's like, well, you know, it's not so bad. I'm, you know, successful YouTuber, podcaster. You've got I, I have a successful channel where I talk about the decline of the West. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so... These kinds of things, they're not, they're not, they're not one to one. It's actually, it's interesting. This is a, a big political issue right now, in fact, because you know President Biden is facing a tough battle for re-election, uh, in part because Americans as a whole perceive the U.S. economy to be doing very poorly. Yeah. And yet, at an individual level, most Americans think that the economy is doing fine. It's just they perceive the overall sort of vibes of the economy. Yeah. Whenever JJ bad. says something like that, you got to fact check it and correct him in the comment section below. It's true. Like, a lot of people, I think they're doing fine. And in per particular, a lot of the people that are sort of the loudest voices for, uh, for like, how bad the economy is are personally doing just fine on their own. There's this kind of sense that, uh, I don't know. Like, it's, it's just, we, ha we live in a society now that is just biased towards pessimism. And I think it's easy to sort of assume that that pessimism is rational or is maybe rooted in growing mental health problems or whatever, but... I don't know. I think that as humans, we just kind of like negative takes more than we like positive ones. Always look on the bright side of life. Who's? I don't know. I half, I half agree. Half agree. Half I mean, disagree. You're, you're, you're a bit of a doomer. I'm a bit no. Of, you're a bit there, of a doomer. There, there's things I just like unequivocally. No. Like, Brogan's relatively optimistic. I'm optimistic, but there's just there's certain things. I think to say that everything's going wrong all the time. Brogan's is, just not delusional. Is bad, but you you do like, like you. I'm not delusional. <laughs> no, but I mean, like <laughs> housing's a big one. I just like housing. I can't get over housing rent prices. Yeah. Um. But I mean, like you know, I I agree. Like I think the rent is, in this country, like the housing situation is is very bad, and a lot of people. It's a very are, Canadian issue too. It is a very Canadian. Yeah. Like our housing prices in this country are double what they are in the U.S. Right. Yeah. So like it's not nothing to sneeze on, but at the same time, it's like even then, it's like you know most people are living like most people are living in houses you know the, the houses is cost more than they can afford but you know it's not like there's a crisis of like you know people like you and me and the rest of us are like on the street and like struggling living in cardboard boxes and stuff like that like the the problem often manifests more theoretically than it does i think in terms of the day-to-day -day pain that people are, are fe facing i mean it's not to dismiss that some people are are struggling but i do think that a lot of us are sort of self-proclaimed kind of like activists on behalf of a struggling populace that we don't actually interact with that much. Yes. I agree. And I think there's like a bit of that in sort of like what you do, right? Like you're, you're, you're the voice of your generation in a way in your YouTube videos, you know, you're sort of taking it upon yourself to be an activist or an advocate for a perceived sort of suffering kind of zoomer generation. Yeah. There's but like, there's, yeah, there's problems. The, the problems have to be defined. Yeah, I think there's a to say everything is just like bad blanketly. Yeah, it's awful because that really doesn't like do anything. But again, like what I would just sort of say is like when you sort of like think about people in your social circle, and I mean like like I feel like I I know your social circle a little bit to some degree. It seems like people are doing relatively okay. Yeah, they're doing all eh. <laughs> yeah. Do all right. All right, come comment comment if you're uh, under thirty, please tell us how your how you and your friend group are doing right now. Love to hear about it. And be honest. Be honest. Don't, 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 don't just say what you think is the politically, uh, you know, correct thing to say. Say, be, be honest with us. Well, if you ask someone why they're lonely, right? And they say they are lonely. Yeah. Um, sorry, if you ask someone if they're lonely, they say they're lonely. Yes. They're lonely. But there's like three reasons. They work too much, but yes. they have the opportunity to have friends. They just like are too busy for them. Mm -hmm. They have no friends. Mm. Or they have like unmet expectations of what life was supposed to be. Yes. Which I think the third option is more common than we like to think it is. Because it's like you grow up with this narrative sense from, from sitcoms, from everything about like how, how your 20s are supposed to be. Mm. And when you find out life like isn't that exciting, 
day to day. Fellow with no friends watching Friends. Which is really... Many such cases. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, but it's not even about not having friends. It's just like, you know, no one, there's no person that exists who has a functioning life who goes to like a house party four nights a week yes. and goes to the bar every night and then eats out every night and has like a giant social circle and always has a girlfriend and also still has enough money, right? Like, that person doesn't exist. So I think it's fine, like, if you think you're lonely, just feel like, like really do an, um, Really do like a check of your life. Look at like what you have. Not to mention all the people that are actually lonely but just don't realize how, how screwed they are. Many, many, many people who would like go up to you. You did a video asking people if they're lonely and young and dundis. And a lot of those people, you know, some people might say, oh, I'm not lonely. I don't hang out with anyone. I don't have any friends. But no, I'm not lonely. They're just low in neuroticism. They're not, they're not aware of their problem. <laughs> but but who is you to say that they have Me. a problem? If you have no friends, you're homies, you don't hang out with anyone but your girlfriend, you are lonely, you just don't know it. But what if they're cool with that? Like, they're a delusional. They, <laughs> a lot of people have a, have so many layers of cope. Yeah, that's I'm, true. I can say, I can look at their life and objectively say that their life is bad. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter that they think it's fine. Uh -huh. I, I say that their life is bad. Uh -huh. And their life is bad, objectively. They have no homies, zero homies, no no adventurous yeah. purpose. I knew a guy like They watch that. Netflix all day. Yeah. They have one, they have a girlfriend, maybe, if they have that, even. Maybe they've got an AI girlfriend, maybe they've got Chad GPT. That's no life, maybe, objectively. But, but it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm sensitive to what you're saying, but it's like, if somebody is living that life and they're delusional. Feel bad. <laughs> Recognize your problem, feel bad, and fix it. But then you're con you're, you're sort of like that's what low neuroticism does to a motherfucker. But you're contributing to sort of like the the sum total of like misery. In the yeah, world. be neurotic. You have misery for a reason. The reason you're miserable when you're lonely is because your body miserable. is crying out for you to change. Yeah, because they have no neuroticism or they know, or they're coping. Sort of saying that in some ways or they're on so many antidepressants they can't even realize that they have problems. But you're saying that it's it somehow the world is improved if if we make these people more. The world conscious. is objectively improved because they go out and they make friends, and then those people without friends have more friends. Uh -huh. And I make actual communities. Right now, we have no communities. People are alone. They're lonely. They don't even know how fucked they are. Most people don't know how fucked they are. Especially not J.J. McCullough, who the train is running towards. Both him and his man. And his society. <laughs> I still hold it with lonely people is you don't see them. Because yeah. I, I just work in such a social industry. And I see tons of people all the time. Every night, I see groups of men and women laughing and carrying on, walking in, getting beer and food, and like talking for five hours all night, like just the most social, like wholesome settings you can imagine. But then the whole, it's like the Hikikomori thing. Like the, the there's a, the, the 10% in, te in Japan, 10% of the population like doesn't leave their apartments. Like yeah. there's people you just don't see. Like, yeah. they're, like they're literally absent from society. Yeah. If you want to be a liberal moral relativist though, there's nothing wrong with that because they're happy. They're happy being Hikikomori because they say that they're happy being Hikikomori. They're yeah. like, oh, I'm so happy being a Hikikimori. Well, I, my life is great. I have my I have my YouTube videos. I have, I have my pint of ben I, ha I have my I have the people that I watch on the internet. I mean, I've got everything I need. So I have sort of two thoughts about this. Like one thing, sorry, one thing is just that like I think that what you hit on is kind of important, Brogan. So it's like if you're working at a restaurant or bartending and all the rest of it, you know, you're exposed to yeah, you know, lots of people socializing. That can become a sort of data point that can kind of inform, maybe not you specifically, but could inform somebody in a position like yours of what the sort of the state of sort of the social health of the culture is. But then also when you have a job like Greg and I have, like if you're a full-time professional YouTuber, you know, you spend a lot of time by yourself, you know, you're sitting in front of a screen. I think like a lot of journalists and writers. Or any other middle-class job where you just from work remotely. Yeah, for sure. And then you sort of the, perceive... Which is you, more and more of you, them. And you perceive your existence to be reflective of broader trends. And I think that that is in general something that we all have to be cognizant of and, and, and fight against. To not... And this is a broader trend. It's a trend that's going broader and broader because more and more people are working from home and no, since no, no. covid That's not what I'm saying. since covid That's not what I'm you saying. don't get to you don't get your second place anymore you, you know your first place is your home your second place is your work and your third place is community center you don't not only do you not get a community center but you also don't get a place to work anymore. the trend you also have one box to live your entire life from the trend and you have zero homies the trend is to look at your own situation and extrapolate your own situation as somehow being reflective of larger trends, which it not always is. And I think that a lot of people who are in sort of like the opinion sharing industries, mm -hmm. whether that be YouTubers or, you know, journalists, columnists, you know, podcasters and so forth. I think by and large, they tend to live a more antisocial, more solitary life by virtue of their career. And then they tend to sort of extrapolate that the trends that they're witnessing in their professional lives lives and their personal lives in their sort of social groups dominated by people in similar professions are somehow reflective of how society as a whole is JJ, going. anyone watching this podcast, it's over for them. It's
It's already time. over for them. I don't know. A lot of people watching this podcast, I'm sure, go in every day to the office and hang out with their coworkers. And uh, yeah, they go into. This is them going into the office. Beep. That's a, that's them in the office. Go this the is them hanging out with their coworkers. Do you get the report? No, I didn't get the report. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's seven p.m. I should have gone to bed by now. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, though, that I would say as well is that what you were saying earlier, Brogan, was you know like this idea. You know, that people's expectations are not met by their lived reality. And I think that's true to a point. But I also sort of like wonder to like what extent, like at what point does the personal responsibility side of things kick in, right? Like at some at some age, we all learn that the hamburger at McDonald's doesn't look as good as the one that's on the TV ad. Right? Yeah. Like we, we, we develop realistic expectations. And we're in particular, we're able to separate sort of fact from fiction. And so I do sometimes wonder... You know, if part of this is just an expectations game that is in part a product of a kind of like lack of maturity, maybe a lack of exposure to, you know, older people or like just an, an accurate understanding of what adult life is really like versus the kind of like the fantastical vision of it that maybe we get fed by the press or television or pop culture. Yeah. I think you should manifest, manifest a little bit. I don't know. It's also like pe some people just think that things are going to get handed to them. Like they're... They're raised to believe, or like they just end up believing that, like they just wait, like opportunities just come to them, and they just stand mm. around and wait for them. I wonder how that happens. Looking at your phone, waiting for opportunities on the on the phone. Hmm. Wonder how that happens. Yeah. All these people with Lamborghinis. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. It just it just it just shows up at your door one day. People just come for you. But uh, yeah, no, it's ridiculous. It's just like you have to. Yeah. I. There is. I don't know, man. It's so confusing. I think about this so much. Yeah. I think about these issues so much. Like, they haunt my brain. Yes. Because I'm like, is it person? Is it did something go wrong? Do we need more personal responsibility? Like, who does the who does the fault lie on? How, how, how do we fix these issues? Yeah. Like, the dating crisis. How does that get fixed? Yeah. Is that the fault of Tinder? Or is it the fault of men being like, I used to deserve a girlfriend? Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, we are. I mean, I think what you said, Greg, is true. Like, we are exposed to, through social media, you know, people are constantly presenting their most heroic versions of themselves in which they've sort of achieved everything. Seemingly. I caused the dating crisis. You personally. Yeah. How many girls you how many you got hundreds, thousands? Yeah. Thousands. That's a little much. Yeah. You took all of them. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh all the God. women. Oh my. Thirty percent of every woman every bull man. Anyway, continue. Uh <laughs> no, it's 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 true. Like we people are like the social media, you know, things like Instagram in particular, are just unique in how curated they are because it's it's not just like you know you're watching somebody on friends on television and sort of like measuring your life based on them which you can concede is obviously sort of fictitious because it's you know a hollywood show or whatever but when you're sort of seeing like your own friends positing this very curated flattering vision of their life i, I do think that that can have an effect that is perhaps a little bit different than the the effect that that pop culture has i also sort of think and i made a video once where i talked about this like the sort of like the celebration of youth success feels different now than it did when I was young. Like, I feel like there's just a lot more celebrities who are like hyper, hyper successful at a very, very young age. Mm. You know, they're millionaires, they're CEOs, they're the biggest pop stars, the biggest actors in the world. And they're, they're like, like you 21. Know, yeah. And I think that that, especially for young men in particular, I think that that has a real kind of effect in terms of. But, I, but, it's, but then again, you can also kind of get into the attitude where it's like, well, why do so many of us have this attitude where we all believe that we were destined for such greatness? Like, why are we unable to be satisfied with, you know, a relatively ordinary middle class existence? Why, why do we all have to be millionaires? Why are so many of these hucksters so effective at pitching young men on these, you know, self-help courses and stuff that promise wealth and riches and women and stuff beyond your wildest dreams? Like, why are so few people sort of develop the antibodies to sort of resist that and to sort of say, you oh, know, that's like an unrealistic fantasy. I don't, I shouldn't even aspire to that. Yeah. I've heard, I, I figured where I heard this, I think it was a Ukrainian talking to me in real life. Mm. I think it was in real life. But yeah, that's what she said. She was like, it's a very different, the, the attitude in the West is that like everyone expects to be a millionaire. Yeah. It's like, well, if, you didn't, if you don't get that, you've been cheated. Yeah. All right, JJ, tell us, tell us uh, a positive trend in society. A positive trend in yeah. society? I mean, I think lots of things are positive. I think I didn't say lots. One. Uh, people are living... 
and people are living comfortably, materially. So has, has material wealth increased for the average person in the last decade? I think the quality of life has increased for the average How so? person. I think that we have access to a lot of nicer things. I think that a lot of things that were once very inaccessible to anybody but the wealthy are now accessible to like some broad middle class people, like you know, computers and fancy TVs and all this technology that we see around us, having fancy cameras, being able to make our own podcasts, and you know, this is the kind of stuff that podcasts like, have been objectively bad for the world. <laughs> this kind of stuff, like even like this, like the whole concept of that, we're able to have these microphones and sort of advanced, you know, uh, music and video editing software. I mean, it's like all been a catastrophe. <laughs> That's an example of something that's 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 pretty good. That no, the techno have. the technology has made us more atomized, isolated, and alone. I mean, it's also allowed us to engage in unprecedented uh, levels of creative self-expression. Oh no, yeah, good, more creative self-expression, just what we needed. Share and develop communities with other like-minded people of a sort that on we never Discord previously. <laughs> I mean, our whole livelihoods are based on this, Greg. I'm pessimaxed, JJ. Yeah, I can tell. I'm pessimaxed. I'm not blackpilled. I'm pessimaxed. Are you optimaxed? I guess so. Yeah, I you're optimaxing. Like, to me, I, I don't. You're a, you're a hope pilled optimaxer. I'm a hope pilled optimistic. I'm on my my optimism arc. <laughs> I, I, but it's like with some of these things, it's like it doesn't necessarily have to be the things are like endlessly progressing and getting better and better and better in an infinite sort of recursive uh, way or recursive. I guess is the wrong way in a sort of like you know exponential way, right? Like it can just be that we're living in a pretty good society and that we have a lot to be grateful for and a lot to be thankful for and that you know our basic sort of rhythm of life is one of material comfort and, uh, you know, healthy, you know, we live long lives, you know, we have lots of advanced medical treatments, we have all sorts of delicious things to eat, you know, we live in safe, comfortable cities, you know, we've got a lot going for us. It's and just I interesting that the person making this argument is a sociopath. Can you explain your anime shirt? My anime shirt? So see, I'm wearing this, this very sharp uh, Naruto shirt that I bought yesterday. Uh, Naruto is a popular anime. I've realized. I've re so I've realized a big a big fashion hack, which is that if you wear anime, you're a fucking sociopath. Okay, so you know I'm almost forty years old, right? Uh, I've been took me a while to kind of get into the fashion thing. When I was young, I was very unfashionable, very dorky the way I dressed. You know, I, I think I was very typical in the way that like fashion when I was young was very intimidating to me, and so I kind of revolted against it by just wearing the dumbest things I could. You know, I would just always wear shorts, for example, all the time, regardless of the weather. And I'm just like, I don't care. I'm just going to always wear shorts and, you know, be kind of defiant in that way. And then as I got older, I started learning more about fashion, you know, watching fashion YouTube channels, trying to dress in a kind of fashionable You'll way. You'll notice at no point is anime okay? in, in I'm, I'm actually up to that. enter this story. I'm leading up to that. Okay. And then I was wearing fashionable clothes, trying to follow the trends and all that kind of stuff. And then recently I realized that if you just wear anime shirts, People will give you more compliments like Patrick than, Bateman shit. than anything else. Like people love you when you wear anime shirts. I don't even uh, like. I'm I'm no anime fan. Yeah, can you can you tell me who these characters are on your so shirt? So I'm not really very familiar with this program. This is Naruto, which is a, a this popular program. <laughs> this is a, a Naruto is a popular anime of some sort, and. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a few of these shirts now. I've got a Naruto one. I've got some Dragon Ball ones. You just know any of the characters on. I any bought of these the shirts. one yesterday. You told me what it was. My Hero Academia. Yeah, I, I, like I don't know what that is, but it's, it's. I'm sure I'll get lots of compliments when I wear it. People like, people like things that they know. Yeah, JJ, this is this is emblematic of everything wrong with the world. Like people are complimenting you because they have no community. They watch the same show as you, yeah. and they and you can't even relate to them on that. You've like you're like blue balling them into a conversation. <laughs> I mean, they, no, it's like, they, okay, what, what happens when someone like comes up and they want to talk to you about Naruto? Uh, well, I just kind of, uh, I try to avoid the conversation going in a direction where I would have to admit that I don't know anything about sociopath. Naruto. So <laughs> it's just kind of like, no, it's like it brightens their day to see, to see my nice, my nice, my cool shirts. And that's, and that's fine by me. I'm happy if I can, if, if people are enjoying my shirt. What's, what is, what is this guy's name? I don't know. This is some sort of lightning man. The and guy, he, this is Sasuke, okay? This is Sasuke. Yeah. And he's using his signature attack, the Chidori, yeah. which is a lightning attack. Yeah. Why, why is it, okay, let's, let's change the conversation slightly. Why is it that, that young men like anime so much? Like, what is it about anime specifically? Because this is something I've really noticed, is that, like every like, young man in... Young women like anime too, young people in general. Okay, fine. Well, let's just say young people in general. Like, what, what, is, what is it with anime? Like, why can it be taken for granted that basically like every young person is a big anime fan? It's not necessarily anime, it's just like 
Sex, there is there, sexy. <laughs> there, there is there is just some good storytelling in some animes that people like. Like Attack on Titan is one of the best told stories yeah. in the world. Like is ever. it better than other things though? Yeah, Attack on Titan is objectively one of the best told stories. Yeah. Well, what's the alternative to, of new media? I don't know. Out? Like like I, I feel like I don't know. Like if you think of something like like Game of Thrones, like. I feel like people are more into anime than they are into like something like Game of Thrones. People or, were very, very into Game of Thrones. People were very into Game of Thrones. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe I'm just like kind of illiterate. In you terms don't. Of we pop don't. Culture. You don't like really consume a lot of pop culture. I don't stuff. consume. You don't a lot play. Of pop you don't play a lot of video games. You don't, don't really watch movies. I don't really. Watch but you're movies. like the pop culture guy. How do you square that? Well, I'm not the pop culture guy. You're, you're the culture guy. I, I do. I mean, I'm aware of these things. Like, I'm aware that they have a lot of cultural resonance. You, you find it very important. One of your main things is people should be culturally literate. I agree. People but you don't, know who narrow, you don't know who the Sasuke is. And you're wearing a Sasuke shirt. I know the gist of it. Like, yeah. I know that, that Naruto is like a ninja and that there, he has like his ninja friends. And, you know, they have adventures and all that. Like, I don't think that there's, <laughs> there's that much more to be culturally literate. Like, it's like the difference is that, like, if you showed me Naruto, I'd be able to say, OK, that's Naruto. You know, like somebody who's culturally illiterate, which is like, oh, that's just some anime guy. Right. So I think that, you know, the, what's different is that I value cultural literacy. I think it's very important. I think it's important that we all be sort of share a common culture. And that requires knowing sort of the cultural tastes of people other than ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to consume that culture. But what sort of distinguishes me from, you know, some of these kind of like right wing reactionaries is that I am not just dismissive of anything that's not my own culture right like i can know that anime is maybe not my thing like it's not for me it's not something that i'm compelled by but i can still appreciate it that it's something that matters to no, a lot you of absolutely people. do that you don't think video games are art oh that's different i can still think video games are you think because you don't like video games so video games are objectively not art no i think that art has a definition that video games do not meet but that doesn't mean I, d I mean, I enjoy it. I've been playing Mario RPG. Yeah, you play it because it reminds you of when you were a child. Yeah. you Because you are a fascist, but you're a fascist for like the 90s. <laughs> you can't you can't be a fascist for... Uh... You're, you would be a fascist if you were born in like the 40s, but no. instead you were born in the 90s. No, because fascists... And, and in the year 2070, you'll still be a fascist for the 90s. No. Like the difference between fascists and conservatives is that fascists don't want to go back. Like fascists have a kind of, you know, a sort of somewhat of a sentimental... They, sentiment. they want to go back to their imagined past. Yeah, but they also want to build a new future. Yeah, and you're a fascist for your childhood. I don't when wanna... when you you imagine that your childhood was good, even though yeah. it was objectively bad, no. <laughs> and you want to go back to it, <clears throat> I, I think that there, I think that there was like a lot that was good in the '80s and the '90s that we should be appreciative and grateful for, and mm -hmm. like people like me are sort of sentimental about. But I don't think that we can like rebuild the '90s or the '80s, and I also don't kind of think that we should create some sort of I don't know sort of uh, dystopian tomorrow based on sentimentality alone, right? Like that's what, that's what sort of fascism was all about. It was sort of like, you have like a vague feeling that things used to be better and you're going to create like a new modern world based on new aesthetics and new ideas that are kind of like vaguely animated by a kind of reactionary impulse to mostly like kind of what we were talking about at the beginning is, is sort of like it's more animated by creating a new society that's built on an unleft or an anti-left, I should say, an anti-left agenda as opposed to a, a genuine desire to conserve what was in the past. Like Hitler's regime was not like a, a, a nostalgic regime. Like it was not a regime about honoring traditional German culture or the traditional German political system or anything like that. It was about sort of creating a new fascist idea of what German mm -hmm. Germany was. So on this on, on left stuff, do you think uh, that political parties are too focused on like attacking each other instead of positing a positive vision? Yeah, I think so. And I think that like you look at you know, you look at sort of what society needs right now, if we sort of concede the existence of some of these problems, I think it, it does need a sort of a solutions focused, uh, you know, political agenda, not a blame focused political agenda. It's uh, it's but it's much easier to like notice problems than it is to propose solutions to them, you know, because solutions require trade offs and compromise. And, you know, it's like we were talking about earlier with this lunatic that's been elected in Argentina, like he's based and cap <coughs> Javier Millier. He, he's 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 very confident and smug, and when he's you know campaigning for president, when he's legalized child slavery, when he's strutting around, he can have all of the based answers. Based alert, 
<laughs> wee woo, wee woo. <laughs> <laughs> when he's strutting around the stage, you know, he can have all of the answers and he can speak in this kind of extremist way. But at the end of the day, you know, he's going to be responsible for the governance of that country and he's going to have to deal with other politicians and, you know, the courts and the bureaucrats and public opinion and all the rest of it. And you can't come up with just kind of like magical snap your fingers solutions. But, you know, people would rather just engage in the rhetoric than actually think about the, the difficult business. The rhetoric is more fun. It is much more fun. It's much more dopaminergic, as yes. you would say. Mm. Right? I do, I do love rhetoric. You do love rhetoric. And, you know, and, and rhetoric gives us a sense of identity for ourselves, and it gives us a sense of, of righteousness. And I think that that is really a big problem with a lot of sort of online political extremism, is that it's just this endless cycle of, of virtue signaling and purity spiraling, being holier than thou. You know, we, we see this right now with, you know, sort of some of the left-wingers and the Israel-Palestine thing. It's like, who can be more anti-Israel, not because they actually care, but just because there's a sort of sense that like, you know, if you're a good leftist, you support Palestine, but then how much do you support Palestine? Well, it's like, I support Palestine so much that I, I hate Israel, and I think they should all go back to Europe, and you know, they should just, you know, their country should be wiped from the face of the earth, and you know, that kind of stuff, right? As opposed to what is actually gonna resolve the problem is gonna be some sort of pragmatic coming together of the two sides in a negotiated Kumbaya, solution. Kumbaya, my lord. I know when I was in university, I really found like what I hated about the left was like the how egomaniacal everyone was. Like you could tell talking to somebody that every single opinion they have is formed from like a, like a sense of self. They're like obsessed with themselves. They think they're smart. They think that they have figured everything out. And now I see that more on the right than I ever have. Mm. I find like right wingers, like the, the contemporary young right wingers, I cannot fucking tolerate any word that comes out of their mouth. They're so annoying. <laughs> they're like, so fucking like the conspiracy theorist shit. It's yes. like you are. An egomaniac. It's all I get from this is you're a fucking nutcase who, who has no sense of the real world. Who is who is somebody that's uniquely sort of obnoxious to you? I just I'm, I feel like I just meet a lot of people. Like I'll meet like a lot normal of normal people. people. Yeah, normal people with unwarranted conversations. Yeah, and they'll just jump in and say something about COVID. I'm like, oh, I don't yeah, yeah. give a fuck <laughs> about this, man. I'm trying to like work here. Yes, yes. Same thing on same thing online. Like Nick Fuentes is fun. Like the, what was once. Like the left, the, the leftist cringe, woke feminist cringe compilation. Yeah. Like I think I see that more on the. You could make that out of the right wing now. Yeah. You could make thousands of those out of the right yeah. wing. Yeah. The shit that fucking Nick Fuentes says. Yeah. Stephen Crowder, Gavin yeah. McInnes, they're insufferable. Yeah. They're insufferable fucking egomaniacs. It's so annoying. We'll I, still get them on the pod though. <laughs> yeah, let's still get them on the, on the pod. I just can't take it. It's so, <laughs> it's so fucking annoying. And I think I think some of that just comes from like how you, how you develop when you have a business model that's based entirely around preaching to the choir, right? Yeah. Like you, you sort of like your, your, your skills at, at sort of meaningful communication atrophy and you instead just become a kind of like shallow propagandist, right? Like you only exist to kind of validate the opinions of your most loyal base. You, your communication skills do not exist to sort of persuade or to communicate knowledge or information. It's all just about sort of signaling that you're good in the eyes of the people that already think you're good. Yeah. And I think that that's like, and that's like the cliche of like the leftist, you know, like the left, the left winger, you know, the stereotypical blue hair, whatever, you know, who's hanging out in the safe space and everybody thinks and like they're, they're protected from anything that would be triggering or anything that would sort of shatter their worldview in any way. The right wing has kind of just reverse engineered that and they've created right wing safe spaces where they never have to be exposed to people that have a different perspective than so they do. True. The right wingers are the real leftists. The right wingers are becoming. I mean, a lot of people sort of say that right wingers are as big of snowflakes. And as that's the, the real horseshoe theory. <laughs> no, definitely. No, it's like people. People are. People are delicate. People are fragile. The problem with the right today is that they're too cringe, like these lefties. They're too. They're too sensitive. I mean, that's one of the things. <laughs> they're but, too sensitive. But I mean, no, it's it is. They're they're too delicate, right? Uh -huh. And I think that that matters because I don't know. It's like you know, my my buddy uh, Bastiat Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of streamer kind of character like he'll sometimes do these debates and i'm sure you guys have seen debates like this like on twitch and stuff where you got well we've got some right winger and some left winger and they just like talk past each other and they just like argue and fight in a, just a very sort of like shrill and obnoxious way because neither of them have any actual skills at, at persuasion or, or meaningful communication they're only used to talking in their own groups yeah and then yeah. so it just becomes and then the point of putting these people in into in the space together is like putting two scorpions in a bottle and shaking it up and just sort of seeing them it's like i remember i i was 
tweeting with Destiny, and I was sort of confronting him about that, and I was like, you're doing these debates all the time. Does anything come out of this? And he was like, no, usually not. It's kind of pointless. Like, no one's mind has changed. Like, no useful information is communicated. It just becomes this kind of gladiator sport. Yeah. Which is not how debates used to be. Like, I'm old enough to remember, like, when debates on television... In the 90s? Yeah. I feel like <laughs> in the 90s... We got him, boys. <laughs> <laughs> No, there was there was there was some skill at like you know being a kind of thoughtful uh, public intellectual who could engage meaningfully with an um, opponent who thought differently than you did, in part because you thought of yourselves as public intellectuals as being part of a similar class. But now it's the thinking is like I'm part of the right wing class, and the right wing class is fundamentally opposed to the left wing class. And the fact that we're both intellectuals or that we're both involved in political commentary that commonality matters a lot yeah less. but that's that's not changing anytime soon i i agree because the market incentives are towards political combat greg no don't do it don't eat the whole bucket of that korean gum korean black gum korean black gum uh i see a third way for what is the third way just like a, just a nice like common sense in between i yeah. totally i totally see that forming i think it will it just has to like there's no there's no solution being offered right now by anybody who's dogmatic hmm. i think like i think destiny's a good example of that like He's kind of Destiny's a little sensationalist. Yeah. But Destiny is kind of that like nuanced, like regular person with regular opinions that just kind of benefit the greater good. Like, yeah. like you know, someone who doesn't believe it's it's like a waste of mental energy to have strong opinions on like critical gender theory in universities. Mm. It's like that's a waste of resources. You know, there's only more important things to worry about. I see kind of Destiny. Destiny is not a normal person. <laughs> But he, there's like there's like a sincerity to him that I respect, like in the sense that like he he Nothing knows wrong with that, but not a normal person. I think Destiny's like Destiny's twelve hour twelve hours a day streaming your life. You're yeah. more you're more streamed than man at that point. <laughs> he had, he had, he had a normal life though before he was a streamer because he only became a streamer in like his late twenties early thirties. He was like a manager at a Burger King and then was like an assistant manager at like a, a custodial company. And had like uh, got married really young. Like he just has a very normal, like the most typical, okay. like lower middle class life until he was like thirty. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But it, but it, it's, it's true. Like I mean, and he comes to politics like he admits his ignorance, and so he is informed by this kind of like rationalistic attitude, where it's like if I can learn enough, if I can acquire the facts, then I will arrive at like a reasonable, sensible conclusion, right? And like that sort of. Uh, that sort of whole approach, the, uh, is it an epistemic approach, right? Like empirical database sort of approach, right? Like that is, I think, defensible. I mean, the problem with him though, is that he still likes the game of political combat. Like he still plays the role that is expected of a person in his position in the year 2020. You have to, to play. play that game. You don't, but do you? I don't know. Like, see, like I, in my, in my world, in my mm. YouTube channel and stuff, I've tried to be resistant to playing that game. It sometimes frustrates me because I sometimes feel envious of people that are, you know, part of the sort of the political cool kids club on, uh, on YouTube. You know, the people whose, whose names and reputations are a bit better known because they are sort of seen as more ideological and more combative. But at the same time, like I'm trying to model an alternative that is maybe a little bit more knowledge based and a little bit more moderate in its delivery. Debate blood sports. Is there no alternative? You should try to. Should have tried doing debate blood sports. Yeah, do, he do, likes do, debate. Do one blood debate sports. blood sports. You've been on. You've been, on, been on PF Young's podcast doing some debate blood sports. Who don't you, you like? You got, a, you got a taste for Who blood. Who don't I like? Like, like the, this, like, you know, Hassan, Destiny, Vosh, like you just toss all those names out there. Which one of those goes like, oh, that guy? Uh, I don't know. Or it's a girl. Like, is there a girl? Yeah, like I don't pay a lot of attention to sort of like the the left wing space just because like a lot of that's just not for me. Like I'm just not really interested in what a lot of them have to say because it does seem too tendentious. Like I find a lot of like these left wing, the bread tuber set and all of that. It's just it's very predictable. Like it's just not interesting to me. And it, it also seems like Jordan more Peterson. What what's he doing now? Jordan it's Peterson, it's gross guy. It's Weird. always like it's always <laughs> icky. It's always it's. I mean, this is this is this is like every like bread tuber, left tuber, whatever you want to call it. It's always like Jordan Peterson bad, Ben Shapiro bad, Prager you bad, and it's just always some version of of a take on one of those three things. And then of course capitalism bad, and you know capitalism is just this kind of like vague force in the world that we just bitch about regardless of what the topic at hand is. Yeah. Um, and that kind of stuff is just, it's, it's boring, like it's not appealing to me. Some of the right-wingers, like the right-wingers are, are troubling to me because I just view them as a more present threat in a lot of ways. Because I, I do think that like the right-wing, as I said earlier, like I think that in a middle-class society, like America in particular, like right-wing, extremist right-wing politics is the bigger 
danger. And so I kind of feel more of a need to kind of bring those people down to earth and sort of dispute some of the things that they're saying. But at the same time, like, I don't, I don't desire to like debate these people, like in part because like, that's the other thing too. It's like, I don't think I'm a great debater. Like I don't have great debate skills. That doesn't mean that like, you're better than you think you are because well, you'll think like I'm not being I'm like oh I'm gonna ask this simple question because that, that's not gonna be a good debate I'm just asking a simple yeah. question and they won't answer it because they're idiots yeah that's like that's all it is like you still win you still, if you're not yelling if you're just like make someone a, a fool make a fool to someone by just asking questions you know yeah you, you could do the you could you could do you still get the you, well. you get the dub well if if you know who on the right wing on the right wing who would you debate I don't want I don't want to call out you want to call people out it's just but I mean like the thing is that. I, I guess like I I care a lot about like coming out good, and I I think a, little, a lot about my responsibility to people that agree with me, and you know I want to be a good sort of champion of 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 people that think like me, but your ability to like win quote unquote a debate or do good in a debate it doesn't reflect anything beyond your ability to be a good debater and being a good debater is not a skill that correlates with, you know, having the facts on your side or anything. It just means that you do better in that artificial format of arguing with somebody in a sort of improvisational sort of way. Yeah. But there's also the desire to disregard all of that stuff as meaningless, but it does actually play a big, pretty big role in convincing people. You, I don't think so. Like, yeah. I, I don't think it convinces people. I think it maybe on like a sort of meta way, like so for example, like Ben Shapiro uh, has a reputation as being a very good debater. And I think that the legacy of that is not necessarily converting people to the right wing as much as it is sort of giving the right wing credit for having intelligent people on its side. Right, so you're you're basically a postmodernist then. Why? Because you don't think there's any point to debates. I don't think... It's all just nonsense words and it's all power game. I mean, I think... I think that it's possible to envision a debate that's done in good faith and that actually has an objective. But that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So you're a postmodernist. I'm not a postmodernist. <laughs> yeah, it's over. No. There's it's no just... point in there's no point in debates. Debates are just blah blah blah. I've and been... so the only the only thing left is group power and kill the opponent. I've been convinced by like some Ben Shapiro points. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think he's made some strong points. Um getting married young. Yeah. Because you wait too long to get married, you get really particular. Yeah. And it just it's just less likely your marriage will work out because you're not growing with somebody. Yeah. So if you get married young, you you grow together, like build a life together. Yeah. And you you get particular together, rather than like trying to find someone to fit into your life when you're 35. Yeah. I thought that was a good point. He made like I, I there's definitely like oh yeah like I watch Ben Shapiro and be like yeah there, that's a good point. Yeah. I yeah. don't really, I don't I don't hate him that much. He's probably one of the better examples. Well, I mean by today's standards, he certainly seems like he's more moderate. Actually, I think that Ben Shapiro is somebody who in some ways has like. I don't know, like, I really do not have a lot of respect for people who opposed Trump very articulately and accurately, and then once they realized that actually the base of the Republican Party was on Trump's side, then they immediately changed their tune. Yeah. And I think Ben Shapiro is a very clear example of that, because I think he argued against Trump in a very articulate and accurate way in the lead-up to his election in 2016, but then, you know, when Ben realized that he was in the minority position on, on, on the right... You know, rather than do like what the bulwark people did and sort of oppose Trump from a sort of principled kind of like conservative place, he instead went and just kind of said, well, if that's the way the winds are blowing, I'll blow along with them. Right? Seven, seven years ago. Yeah. That was seven years time. ago. It was a long time. It is a long time. It's, it's crazy to me to think that like Biden has almost finished his first term. I feel like he was just elected like yesterday. Yeah. But uh, but no, a, a lot of. A lot of right wingers, I mean, this is kind of a tangent, but I, I just think like a lot of right wingers, a lot of right wing intellectuals, like they know that Trump is an idiot and that he would be a terrible president. And yet they go along with it anyway. They play along with it. They defend him and they suck up for him and all the rest of it just because they know that that's what the audience wants. And that is just a very intellectually indefensible position, I think. And it makes me sort of like not respect a lot of conservatives because I just feel like that is the sort of the default disposition. Like if you, and this again gets into sort of like the intersection of like partisanship and political ideology. It's that at the end of the day, you're, it's like a team sport. You're expected to support the candidate of your team. 
And even if you have like serious misgivings, well, you know, you put those aside because at the end of the day, no matter how bad Trump is, the left wing is much worse. And so we won't talk about the ways that Trump is bad. We'll JJ's only- been in a world where truth's been dead for like 20 years, but like he hasn't realized it yet. And there's going to be like the part of the movie where it's like, truth's never been there. And you think back to all the times you thought truth was there. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> Whole world crumbles in. Truth's dead. Postmodernism wins. Debates RFK? are all power games. This is all RFK? true. RFK? He seems like a crank to me. No, RFK is a crank? Is a tr- what, are you surprised by that? Of course he thinks RFK is a crank. He hates all that is good and pure in this world. <laughs> I like RFK. RFK is obviously a crank. I mean, his his he like just has a deeply fundamentally conspiratorial worldview. Like his whole yeah, he think he thinks that there was like uh, incent like financial incentives for like the pandemic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like he's crazy. That's ridiculous. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. He he. If you if you actually look at some of the things that RFK uh, didn't he say COVID was made in the lab? What? Dude's insane. Dude should be checked into a mental asylum and medicated with antipsychotics. <laughs> COVID was not made in the lab. Oh yeah, where'd it come from? We don't know. Pangolin. We don't know. Pangolin. Pangolin bat. Ba- a pat thing, bat pangolin, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know where it came from. Could be, could be anywhere. Could be anywhere. Wasn't that from the? It was, it was like, it was, it was like a bat near the Wuhan lab, Wait, lab don't, right? Don't, don't hit the cord with the. It was, it was a bat near the Wuhan lab, I think. Oh yeah, near the Wuhan. Yeah, I maybe mean, it was a pangolin, like yeah. that lived under the Wuhan lab. Yeah, yeah it's possible. There. It could have come from any number of places. But anybody who is strutting around confidently telling you that they know exactly the story of where COVID came from and who was behind it and who was behind the vaccines and what the we vaccines can all agree were. that it was caused by climate change, though, and the destruction of the natural habitat and people going further and further into places they shouldn't go. Like bat, bat caves. Like bat caves. And labs you find in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uninhabited labs. Okay, so so RFK is bad. Yeah. So if it was between RFK and Trump, though, who would you pick? RF, RFK, Biden, and Trump, because RFK is independent now. Yeah. So it's, those are the three. Well, obviously, pick Biden. RFK versus Trump. I would probably support RFK over Trump, yeah. Hmm. Biden over RFK? Yeah. That's crazy. Why is that crazy? He loves his, Biden. His, his aides are coming out and saying he's too old to run. His aides were like, we need, we need to do yeah, something. Yeah, but this is, this is such a stupid take because like, there is no evidence that Biden's age has actually affected his job to be president in yeah, any way. Yeah, if you don't like listen to anything he's saying, it's like completely But the irrelevant. job of the president is not to give speeches without occasionally stumbling over yeah, the, a word. Yeah, the job of a president is to just kind of be like a, like a, like a corpse. No. <laughs> puppeted around by their party. The job of the president is to do <laughs> and his... say demented things every five minutes. The, <laughs> the job of the president is to do his constitutional duties. And there's no... No one has raised any concern that... Uh, Biden is not able to perform the job. No one, right? And you can contrast to, I was talking about this with P.F. Young in one of his podcasts, right? It's like Ronald Reagan, when he was near the end of, of his term, he was also an old man and sort of the dementia was starting to seep in and people did raise concerns. People within his own administration said that he was kind of out of it at times. You know, he was falling asleep. They didn't trust his judgment. You know, his memory was sort of failing and that kind of stuff. And there's been not a peep of that in terms of Biden. The only thing is that people just don't like that Biden's old. It kind of makes them, it's kind of weird to them on some level. And that maybe occasionally he stumbles when he's giving a speech, which isn't that big of a deal because that's not the president's job. The what, president's, what are these aides saying? I haven't heard about these aides. Oh, they're just saying they're concerned he's too old to run. Um, yeah, they're made, concerned made, that it's politically it's a liability, which is true. Yeah. Like most mm-hmm. people think, like when you ask people, what's your biggest problem with Biden? They say he's too old. They don't say anything about how his age affects his ability to do the job. It's all just he's too old and I don't like it. And yes, Democrats do worry about that because, you know, people could say, I don't like Biden because he's too tall. You know, I don't like Biden because he has white hair, right? Like, I don't like Biden because I don't like Jill Biden. Like, people can dislike the president for whatever irrational reason they want. But if you're engaged in the sort of the business of a campaign, you have to be sensitive to what people are criticizing. And that's and that's bad news for Biden because there's not much he can do to stop that, right? Like he can't make himself magically younger. He just kind of has to hope that, you know, his other attributes he's trying translate. all that baby blood he's been drinking he must be in the foreskin cream <laughs> if you're the president of the united states you get the, yeah you get the foreskin you get the foreskin cream. he's got the foreskin cream, cream. he was uh he he's i don't know what he would do, what he can do to mitigate that he i noticed the other it was, it was his birthday the other day and uh he posted a a, a sort of picture on instagram where he was all like, those candles, all the candles, and he was sort of like making a joke about it. It's like, oh, oh, I hope the people at the candle factory got paid overtime for this one and that kind of stuff, right? So I don't know, but 
I just I just think it's a kind of it's a BS criticism of him. I think Biden's been a pretty good president, all things considered. I think certainly uh, if you're a progressive person, there's a lot that you should be grateful for. And I think to just as a president who's kept America sort of stable from like a conservative perspective, from my perspective, someone who's sort of maintaining America's position in the world and sort of upholding American institutions and not threatening the destruction of the constitutional order the way that Trump did. I just can't take him serious. I can't take him seriously as a as a figurehead, as a mascot for the free world. Mm. I think he's awful at that. I think, I don't know, that matters a lot to me is that the rest of the world just views the West with respect. Yeah. I just don't see that as much. I saw it like more with Trump in like an unhinged kind of way, but with Biden, I just don't, I don't, I don't see like, no one takes Biden seriously. There's no world leader who looks at Biden and goes like, oh, yes, Joe Biden. Well, I don't know. I mean, like Biden just helped negotiate this ceasefire and the war in Gaza. I mean, that's a pretty sort of substantial accomplishment. I mean, I think that the other world leaders were kind of afraid of Trump and they certainly didn't respect Trump because Trump was just like a raving madman. We need, we need fear and respect. <laughs> Biden's no fear, no respect. Trump was all fear, no respect. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely, I would like to see a younger president, don't yeah. get me wrong, and I'd like to see sort of more of, because I'm sensitive as well, like you want the person who manifests, like, you know, I'd like a to Zoomer see president, him. perhaps? A Zoomer president? Yeah. Good, good God. Well, like, I'm trying to, you know, like, Biden walks in a room, and no one, like, straightens up. But I mean, but like Biden has been a rune for a long time that he does have a lot of relationships, you know, like if he goes to other countries, you know, he probably has connections to the the world leaders and sort of the power players in those those countries. You know, he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee when he was on the Senate. So like Biden has a lot of experience and experience matters. Like we should value experience more. And I think it's actually disturbing to think that somebody like RFK Jr., who's never held any political office in his entire life, thinks that he can just waltz into the Oval Office and somehow be ready from day one. Yeah, and he's a Kennedy. It's, it's, it's within him. It's the racial spirit of the Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, it says something about like the, the unserious way that we treat politics now, that the idea that, like because RFK Jr. kind of like, you know, he says the right things or his vibes are kind of like cool or whatever, that we think that that's what it takes to be president. What did Trudeau do before he was elected? I mean, I think Trudeau was unqualified to be prime minister. Trudeau was, I think, the first liberal prime minister who has never been a cabinet minister before. Mm. You know, uh, Harper and Mulroney had never been cabinet ministers, but the, tr the Liberal Party used to have this long tradition of like, you know, the Liberal Prime Minister is always a former cabinet minister from the previous uh, Liberal administration. And Trudeau had no executive branch experience at all. He had been a backbench MP for, I think, two terms before he was uh, prime minister. So yeah, I think there's a lot of criticism to be made of Trudeau being unqualified for the job. And look at that turn. Now this podcast is gonna get taken down because we're Trudeau critical. It's true, it's we're gonna, true. We're gonna get Bill C-11'd. Sure. That's what happens in Canada. Yeah. You criticize Trudeau and you get taken down. Yeah. This is Canadian unfriendly content. Yeah, and then made. And then you get, <laughs> they paid you. you guys, I, go, I go to the therapist, I say, oh, therapist, my podcast got taken down. I just, it's been really affecting my mental health. This is Have my, you my, considered suicide? Yeah, this, yeah. this is my livelihood. It's like, oh, you should kill yourself. Yeah. You should die. Yeah, yes. actually, um, with this great new program, Life Insurance, uh, it costs $2,000, you can kill yourself. And that money goes straight to the Pfizer's pocket. Who makes, whoever, who makes the fucking euthanasia drugs? Yeah. Well, maybe a good last question is uh, reflect on the they were called horseshoe theory. Mm. Um, you you like to think that uh, these these left wingers who are socially conservative are actually right wingers. Oh. Um, what what do you make of horseshoe theory? Is there legitimacy to it? We've talked about how the far left and the far right both support the enemies of the West, for example. Yeah. So what do you what do you make of what do you think of the idea of horseshoe theory? I mean, I think it's an interesting way to sort of frame things. I I, I do think though that generally speaking when we're talking about sort of like the people at the, the two ends of the horseshoe, the far left and the far right, I think that the part of the horseshoe theory that we sort of fail to acknowledge is that those parts sort of converge and they become the same. Like they don't, they're not just like two factions that sort of arise at, that independently arise at the same conclusion. They're often people that arise at the same conclusion for the same reasons. And so in that sense, they become part of a common coalition and not, you know, sort of two disparate. And that's what we call the Nazbol. No, that's not what we call the Nazbol, right? The Nazbol is coming. The Nazbol is coming. <laughs> Greg, uh, the joke is that Greg believes in the Nazbol the way that uh, Linus in Peanuts believes in the Great Pumpkin. Nazbol's comment, comment LJJ in the chat. 
<laughs> no, but it's like, I, I definitely think that like, depending on what the issue is, you know, some people that are so far to the left that they start making right wing style arguments, I think often just cross over and become right wingers, right? Because whatever that issue is that they care about so much, if the right wing is the only sort of political faction that is championing that issue, then you may as well just like recalibrate your whole political right, identity. Right. So just, just to be clear, the, de the, the people who hate the Democrats from the left yeah. end up becoming right wingers. They can, right? Like, for example, like if they believe that like the biggest problem facing America is the Democratic Party or the Biden administration, and your criticisms of them just get more and more extreme to the point where like any criticism of them is valid, then yeah, naturally at some point it it becomes not irrational to support the political party that has the best chance of unseating the Democrats, which is the Republicans, right? Mm, so, That's not so, an irrational conclusion. So Hassan vehemently hates the, uh, the Democrats. Yeah. So what, he's going to vote Republican I now? Know. I don't know enough about him. But like definitely like somebody like Glenn Greenwald, right, who sort of would previously have conceptualized himself as somebody that like hates the Democrats from the left. His hatred of the Democrats has gotten so extreme now that all he does is spend his time on Fox News and making apologies for Donald Trump and saying Trump isn't so bad and like he's being unfairly maligned. Right. So Russell Brand's a right winger. I think Russell Brand is definitely on that track. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good example, actually. Yeah. That's a good example. And I mean, like the but, same. But Russell Brand goes on Fox News and brings up economic talking points. He I think like he has that, this big I think, list. I think he did that once. And I think now he just goes on, uh, on, on Fox news and says, you know, things that the Fox news audience wants to hear because like, again, like there's a market incentive as well, particularly when you're a political commentator, right? Like you want to keep getting invited back on these shows. You know, you sort of, you make peace with your new tribe. With right. Your so new our community. opinion, our opinions are all at the whims of capital basically. I think that if we're, we're all, we're all dancing on capital's treadmills <clears throat> as JJ Nicola. If and I couldn't agree more. If you're if you're in the business of uh, of selling your opinions, you know, then you have to have opinions that are marketable, and there has to be an audience for them. People with idiosync. I mean, this is I think this is actually a, a bit of a tragedy. Is that people with? I would like to see people with more idiosyncratic medleys of opinions, but the problem is that it's very hard to market that to a particular audience because now when you're marketing yourself as a political opinion haver, you have to know who your audience is. You have to target a particular audience mm -hmm. and you have to give them consistent, predictable content. Yeah, so because everything that's what ends they up want. getting sorted into left and right. Precisely, basically. right? So, you know, if you don't do that, you know, I try not to be, I mean, I guess I'm somewhat predictable in, in some ways, but... You, you probably have a pretty wide array of viewers. Yeah, I think so. I have I don't viewers think, on the right and the left. I don't think of you as like, oh, J.G. McCullough, the moderate conservative... Yeah. What was that article where they, they brought you up? They're like gay, gay like LGBT <laughs> content creator. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Noted gay, JJ McCullough. Yeah, no, I was. Queer content creator. I was once. Queer I was once. Content creator. Technically was, true. Yeah, gay I and a content creator. I was once. I was once. Uh, there was an article about some of my activism against Bill C 11, the YouTube regulation bill in Canada. And, you know, they had a quote from me and it just sort of said like, JJ McCullough, an LGBT content creator from Vancouver had this to say, right? <laughs> and it's just like, that's just such a preposterous way to characterize me, but. <laughs> yeah. No, the sorting, the sorting is, the sorting is real. I mean, and I think if you don't want to be sorted, I think that all you can really do is just sort of not make explicitly political content, which is like what I do. You know, I make content that has sort of political themes, but I don't do political commentary. And so as a result, I think that they're, I sort of invite myself to be sorted a little bit less because it seems more incidental to what the kind of stuff that I'm offering to the world. Whereas if you share any sort of opinion, even if you start out having an idiosyncratic mix of, you know, combination of right and left opinions, eventually your audience will come to demand one type of opinion more than others. And then if you express that other sort of side of yourself, you know, you'd alienate people, you know, this no, is you got to flip flop between far left and far right every year. I um I don't know. I, even in, in my comments, I get I'm still really small, I guess, but I get people being like, cause people say I'm based. Like they'll be like, oh my god, you're so fucking based. Like finally, someone into art who's like conservative. Yeah. You know, I'll get that. And yeah. I'll get like in the same video, like, oh, like you're such a good socialist. Like you're really making yeah. good like anti-capitalist points. That's because yeah. you're a conservative socialist. You'll be you'll we be figured it out. I'm mega communist. I'm like <laughs> yeah, a you're mega mo moderate. Mega yeah, you're communist. a moderate mega communist. Okay, basically. you'll you'll a moderate Nazbol. You'll be, if you don't, if you don't watch yourself, you'll be sorted at some point. You have to, I mean, because, you know, the temptation will be, because you're starting off, you're still new as a YouTuber, you'll realize at some point what the audience wants. You know, you'll make a video 
that will be very successful. And then you'll make a video making a different point and it will perhaps flop. And then you'll sort of think to yourself, well, I don't want another flop. I should steer clear of that topic. You know, yeah. that's not a great one to be, uh, to be going after. Yeah. Right? They, w- they want a, they want a based guy, uh, making all the same points everyone else makes, but talking about art every five minutes. So it sounds kind of different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd be very curious, like if you made, and this is actually something that I, I find is like interesting with, with male YouTubers is that if you made a video that had like female stuff as a dominant theme, if that would be a big flop. I Probably. Yeah. I, I, I Partially because you're not interested in feminine things. Well, I've wanted to make a video about how, like, gender uh, presents in art. Mm. Like, how, like, what are the characteristics of art made by women? Because there is, like, a different characteristic to it. Like, I don't think, not in, like, not in, like a sexist way or hierarchical way. I don't, I don't think a woman could have been, like, Jackson Pollock. But I also don't think um, a man could be someone like um, Mary Pratt, like the mm. painter from Newfoundland, mm. who is like, hyper-realistic. Like, there's a very different... Thing to it. That would be really interesting. Yeah, interesting. I yeah. would, I would, I think that would be a cool video. I'd also be very curious to see. I think the audience reaction to that video would be very revealing as to sort of the audience that you've started to cultivate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see. But that's my okay. One final question. Yes. What is the horseshoe? What is the horseshoe between me and him? There's the horseshoe theory. I represent something. He represents something. Mm. Bro- Brogan really needs to figure this out. He keeps trying. He needs there to be an answer. What do you see it as? What do I see it as? I mean. <laughs> Like in terms of like what the title means to me. Yeah, like what 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 are me and Greg the opposite on, but we're so opposite that we're closer together. I mean, I don't, I didn't never really sort of thought of you guys in that way. <laughs> I thought of you guys like I thought of like the horseshoe theory is just because you're both sort of interested in in odd people, odd people perhaps on the left, odd people on the right, and that you guys are sort of like the connective. You guys are the 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 ring on the horseshoe. That's how the horseshoe works, right? The metaphor is that like the far left is over here and the far left, or is the far left and the far right in the, 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 the ring the, part of the horseshoe? The metaphor is that the far left and the far right are together. Okay, not just politics, anything. Yeah, yeah. Is that the, the two extremes of a spectrum are close together. Yeah. We're going to get Sam Hyde over here and Contra points over here and they're going to kiss. <laughs> no, but it's like if we think of like the horseshoe, the big U shape, yeah, right? The two, the two so the two extremes are, are in the middle. And right? they're closer together than they are to the center. Okay, and yeah. That's, so, what, that's what horseshoe theory hold is. Hold on. They're, okay, I don't want to drill, dwell on this too long. But like, if we're just thinking of like the horseshoe with the arc, okay, yeah. are the extremes in like the the peak of the arc, or are they on the two legs of the horseshoe? The legs are on the bottom. Okay, so, so it's upside on, down. On the two legs, so like the, the legs come and come okay. really okay. close together, okay. and they're far from the center. And the okay. center is yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, so I it's guess like, it's like destiny. I'm trying to think of an example here, like destiny and Nick Fuentes. No, I'm trying to think of a better. No, example. I no, I, I get it. I get yeah. it, right? But it's like I guess I if if I'm understanding the metaphor correctly, I just kind of think of like you and Greg as like you're the you're the arc that sort of connects those two together. Oh, we're the center. Yeah, you're the center. Interesting. Yeah, that's new. That's I don't, a new interpretation. I don't think of either of you guys as being particularly ideological, and I think that's what makes you you interesting because like you're young people that are not overly self confident about your own politics, which I think is attractive and compelling. It's why you guys I think are you know, admirable and interesting young, young men. Cause you're not overly cocky and you're not overly like, uh, sort of hectoring and, and all of that. You, you have a genuine sort of spirit of curiosity. And I see this podcast as sort of a manifestation of that curiosity. Wrong. Yeah, that's it's because I'm far left and you're far right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's a uh, schizophrenic. I'm autistic. Yeah. Or I'm ironically detached and you're hyper sincere. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's like uh, 140 IQ. I'm 80. Okay. Well, I mean, either way, these are not political. <laughs> Those are just opposites anyway. These are well, the no, horseshoe the, theory exi- exists on philosophical sp- grounds. It's not necessarily just politics. They're the same. Yeah. They become the same. No, 80 and 140 are the same. Yeah. I mean, oh, really? Yeah. That's the whole, the IQ horseshoe. Oh yeah. The IQ horseshoe. Yeah, is yeah. that like the, the, the dumb, the, me no kill self. <laughs> and then the smart guy is like, life is beautiful. And the guy in the middle is like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> the midwit, the 110 IQ. You, you, you guys, you guys have a lot in common, I think. You're, you're, you're similar. I mean, you're obviously like, you know, you look different and you come from different backgrounds and all of that. But yeah, that's the, the horde, the, the Scottish, um, Levin, Levin, yeah, the Scottish Levantine mm-hmm. horseshoe. <laughs> yes. But no, I mean, I, I I think actually, actually, here's one. Here's one of my hot takes. Actually, I think a podcast is worse when the hosts are too different from each other. I feel like there's often this like sort of naive fantasy that a lot of uh, sort of politically minded people have, where it's like, okay, I'm going to be like a conservative, and I'm going to get my left wing friend, and we're going to do a podcast together, and it's going to be crazy because we're from two opposite ends, and blah blah blah. And I think that never works well. Yeah. I think that you want people that that vibe well and that get along well and that have 
speak the same language on some level and are sort of simpatico in that way. And I think that you guys have a lot in common. And so I don't see it as a, as a sort of coming together of two extremes. Yeah, right? I agree. Yeah, I think we have we want the same things out of people. Mm. We have the same questions, the same like philosophy. Sometimes I'll ask like the bird's eye view questions, and sometimes you will. Sometimes I'll dive deep. Like with with the umamis, you were diving deep. You were yeah. like vertical. Yeah, we did Let's talk of, about that. All right, did a bit of swapsies there. And then I was like, "But what's it all mean?" And then mm. you know, usually it's the reverse. So I think we've done a. Yeah, I think we're doing good. It's it's the curiosity, right? I think like that's the sign of a good podcast. If the hosts are genuinely interested in other people. And I think that definitely comes through f from both of you. You, d you. you guys fundamentally like people. You're interested in people. And I think that's what you want a host to do. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till we get three camera angles. Three camera angles coming soon. Good. Also, um, more interesting, more, more and more, more interesting guests. Sam Hyde, Ben Sam Shapiro, Hyde, ben Shapiro. Contra points. Contra points. And they're all going to kiss. Ollie Sunvia, <laughs> definitely. And they're all why why do they all have to be political wackos? Well, we're gonna get we're gonna get regular wackos too. It's just like regular people, John Mayer people people who are in like the tur like Toronto generally, oh. or people who are visiting Toronto. Oliver Tree, let's get some and and I've, everyone not. everyone on this couch, they all know each other. It's true. Yeah. We're yeah. all best friends. We're all best friends. We all hang out. <laughs> <laughs> and JJ and Perry. Yeah, we're building real community. And uh, if anyone's what finished this podcast, what's what's pro what's our best podcast so far? What should we direct them to after this? Our best podcast is probably the I like the umami one actually. Yeah, umami? I was gonna say plastic pills. I like umami. That was a great like lots of just like one topic. Talk about art. Talk about like making art. Talk about being artist. Talk about making money. Mm -hmm. Talk about like wars. Talk, everything. I think that was a really good episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm keen to listen. I haven't heard it yet. Love doing mommies though. I like, and just Justin's like a very Justin has a really nice voice. Mm -hmm. I really like listening to Justin talk. It's like relaxing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cool. All right, horseshoe theory hard launch done. Done. Completed. Completed. <laughs> Bang. <laughs>